works. Now watch this. The word is only able to work when you imagine it. Mm, yes, it's good. only able that's to good. work. Amen. It's power. And the work it does. Listen, listen to how big this is. Listen to this, the two, two translations. In other words, as I told you, it says the word of God which is indeed at work in you that believe. We can say it's indeed in work at, at work in you who imagine. Listen to this. The Living Bible says, you, as, you accepted what we said as the very word of God, which of course it was, mm -hmm. and it changed your lives when you believed it or imagined it. Amen. Yes. It changed Amen. your life. The word of God has the power to change your life if you believe it or if you imagine it. Yes, amen. The Passion amen. Translation. Woo, listen mm -hmm. to this. The Word continues to be an energizing force yes. in you who believe. Woo, yes. All right, so amen. only so the if calls or the clause here is if you believe it. So I'm going to use the word imagination because we understand that. Mm -hmm. The Word continues to be an energizing force in you who imagine it. Come on, amen. Otherwise, amen. it doesn't have that power over amen. you. Amen. So imagination then is our ability to believe is the most marvelous, most miraculous, and as the Lord said to me when we were at the beach, He said, it's the most off-the-chart, powerful force that the world has ever known. Amen. It's what imaginations that you carry on the inside of you. That's the most powerful force you can tap into Amen. if you take... Cause see, see do, you, do you remember a scripture that says... Now, this is a Bible scripture. I want to see if you remember. I'm going to quote it the best I can. You tell me if it's in the Bible or not. It says that there is a place that this Word of God can be of no effect. Mm, mm -hmm. Is that right? right? So you can take the right. effective Word of God mm -hmm. and make it ineffective. That's right. That's right. Amen. What, what was the thing that made it ineffective? Anybody remember? Unbelief. Mm -hmm. Unbelief did it for them. And Jesus said it was by your traditions, mm -hmm. which is the wrong beliefs, right. which is your unbelief. Right. So by your traditions, you can cancel out this. Mm -hmm. And so he says it only becomes effective, and effective it is, effective and powerful. The Amplified Classic says the supernatural power of God. It's a superpower. Like a, like a superpower of God is available if you can take the Word in your creative heart and imagine it. But you've got you've to put it into that imaginative place. Say amen if you can see that. So the Word of God continues to be an energizing force in you who imagine. Imagination, then, is the most marvelous, miraculous, off-the-chart, powerful force that the world has ever known. Amen. But see, the problem is that most people use their imagination, their God-given ability to believe something. They use it against themselves. Wow. And so they begin to believe the negative. Yeah. Uh, they imagine what they don't want. And they begin to create that. They've imagined problems coming, disasters coming, troubles coming. They imagine things in a long way. That, that's called worry. It's called, it, it develops into fear. Right. And it can even develop into phobias that keep you locked in a back room somewhere. Right. Simply because you've used your God-given ability to dream and imagine, to imagine the wrong things. Amen. So it's time that we start using our imagination for what God meant for it to be used for. And that's why God's had us on this. So your God-given ability to imagine can take you, as we've been saying, from an ordinary day to an extraordinary day yes. simply yes. by... To me, to me, when that computer came on the other night when we used our faith and our imagination properly, it turned my unimaginative, aggravating day into a very extraordinary day for me. Yes. And, uh, and that's why. Now, I want to show you somebody that that happened to. Look at the book of Daniel right quick. Yes. How many, give me just a few more minutes. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm finishing up now. I'm on my last page. If I was Paul Harvey, I'd say, page two. That didn't go over good because you don't know who Paul Harvey was. It's all right. Probably wasn't a good impression, so don't worry about it. All right, Daniel chapter three. Tell me when you found that. You ever, you ever heard about these guys? Um, I'm going to tell you about, about three guys. I'll read their names to you. Their names were Han Haniah, Mishael, and Azara. Anybody ever heard of those? Well, they were given new names called Shadrach, Meshach, and Tebedwego. Remember them? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, they held an image on the inside of them, and I want you to see it. Now, what was happening was they, in, they were in a foreign land. These were God's men, young men. Now, these weren't little kids. When you say Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they weren't little boys. These were actually people that King Darius had already, actually Nebuchadnezzar, had already put them in charge of some of the leadership of Babylon. And so these were, these were grown men, young men, but they were in, in great positions of leadership, as was Daniel. And so these were three of Daniel's buddy, uh, buddies. I mentioned a moment ago their Hebrew names, but they got new names when they got there, with Shadrach, Meshach, and, and Abednego. And so they had a new rule that was put out. You remember this? The king, Nebuchadnezzar, said, uh, I'm going to make a new rule that when you hear the music, the harp, and, the, and the, uh, the cornet, and all the different instruments playing, you have to bow down and worship my image because he had an image of himself now, and that became the new idol or the new god of the country because he was the god, and they wanted, he wanted everybody to bow down to it. And you see that in verse 21 and so on in chapter 2. 
I'm sorry, chapter 3. Turn to chapter 3. Tell me when you're there. Amen. At verse, uh, verse 8, it says, And whenever you hear, um, let's see, am I in the right place? Yeah, you, then you fall down. Verse 10, Thou, O king, has made a decree that every man shall hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sack, but the psaltery. This is 310, if you're there with me. Yeah. Sack, but the psaltery, and the duclamire, and all kinds of music. You shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever falls not down and worships, that he should be cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Yeah. And of course you know that. Well, then there were certain Jews, and he mentions these guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Go over to verse 13. Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage, because they didn't, they didn't bow down. They wouldn't bow down to it because they were believers. They bowed down only to God. You know right. the story. Right. Verse 13, well, it said that Nebuchadnezzar then, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego before him. And they brought these men before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, uh, why are you not doing this? Let's, let's just read it. I'm reading King James, sorry. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods nor worship my golden image when I've set, which I've set up? He said, now, I'm going to give you another chance. Verse 15, now, if you be ready that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sack, butt, psaltery, and duck lamar, and the, and the guitar, and the banjo, and all kinds of music, if you'll fall down and worship the image which I've made, well, that'll be good with you. But if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And it is, and, and, excuse me, and who, he says, in a very uh, sarcastic attitude, he said, and who is that God that will deliver you out of my hands? You know, you say you got a God you're going to worship, but let's see him deliver you out of this because I'm going to have you thrown in the burning fiery furnace if you don't do that. Well, now listen, I want you to see the image, the imagination that these guys held. They had already seen people thrown into this burning fiery, burning fiery furnace. They had seen people die. And the fire was so hot that uh, it actually, you know the story, it burned up the men that were going to throw them in. But what, here's, here's what happened. Let's, let's pick it up because I want you to see the image in their heart. You know the story, but I want you to see the imagination of their heart. When he said, I'll give you a chance, and, and if you don't, let's see who's going, what God's going to deliver you. Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said unto the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. In other words, we do not have to put any extra thought into thinking about this. We have already put all the thought we want to. He said, if they said, if it be so. Now, I'm sorry, but I have heard people preach, if it be so means if God will deliver us. And that's not what they said. They said, look, you say that if we don't bow down, you're going to throw us in the furnace. If that's true, yeah. if you do throw us in that furnace. Now watch this. If you do, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And not only is he able, he will deliver Amen. us out of the hand, yes. thy hand, O king. Amen. He will do it. Amen. He will do it. Amen. Now see, that a lot of people have missed that part about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were strong in the fact that our God is not only able, but he's going to deliver us. Yes. You, you put us in that fire, we're going to be delivered. They were, I don't know if they held an image of the fourth man was going to walk with them in the fire. I don't know what image they were holding, but they were holding an image that that fire has no power over us. They were holding an image that our God is going to deliver us. I don't know if he's going to deliver us before we get in there or after we get in there. If you throw us in, if you can, if you can't, you won't. But God's delivering us from this thing. We're not going to burn it. So they're holding the right image. And then they said, verse 18, but if not, not if God doesn't deliver us. They said, if you don't throw us in, you be it known today, O king, we're not going to serve your gods nor worship your golden image which you set up. And then, of course, Nebuchadnezzar was full of wrath and he told him, heat up the furnace seven times hotter. How many ever remember the story? And it was so hot, they grabbed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in their, in their full clothing and their hosiery and everything they wore in that, that dress of that day. And they brought them up there and the soldiers that were throwing them in, the fire was so hot, it consumed them. And they threw him in. And of course, you know the story. King Nebuchadnezzar from his high position looked down into that furnace and he said, uh, oh, excuse me, <laughs> how many men fell in that furnace a minute ago? Didn't we put three in there? And they said, yeah, king, it was just three. So well, I see four in them in there. And they're walking around in there. And he said, the fourth one looks like the son of God. Well, of course, you know the story. They had bound them hand and foot and the fire didn't burn their clothing. They didn't even have the smell of smoke, the Bible says, when they got out. But their image, the imagination they held that God was going to deliver them brought a mighty deliverance to the point that Jesus himself came into that burning fiery furnace with them and they were walking around like it was a cool summer day on Gilligan's Island, man. I mean, they're laid back in peace and blessing and nothing can harm them. But it had to be from what... Now, now the re, let me tell you why I chose this story. I mean, the Holy Ghost led me, but let me tell you what he put in my heart this morning. He said, the reason I want you to share about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, because I declare in Hebrews chapter 11, they did this by faith. Mm. Yes. They're in yes. Hebrews chapter 11. Yes. They did this by faith. So their faith, what is their faith? Their confession yes. and their imagination of the heart. The faith Amen. of the mouth and the faith of the heart 
together and they could not be destroyed even by something that destroyed the ones that were right there with them simply by the imagination that they held on the inside of their heart. Say amen if you can see that. Now, I'll tell you um, a couple of things I want you to write down. Miracles open up for the open-minded person. Now, this is what I want you to write down a phrase called open-mindedness because this is what I'm trying to get across to you. You have to get out of the closed negative mindsets and you have to become open-minded. One man I was reading about said that open-mindedness is essential. Now, essential means it's vital for your believing. In other words, if you don't, if you don't open up, now I don't mean open up to anything, but I mean open right. up to whatever God's Word says. For example, right. let's go back to something simple. If the Bible says with His stripes you were healed and the doctor said you're going to die in two weeks, it, it's hard. Ha, have you ever noticed, and God says it's this way, Jesus actually said it's this way, have you ever noticed that the doctor's report, and I'm just using this for an example, not all of you had such a thing, but some of you had. You ever had a doctor's report of something negative against your body and, and don't, you're not mad at the doctor because the doctor did exactly what he was trained to do. Right. He searched, he found, and he diagnosed, and he prognosed, and here it is. This is what the book says, and this is what's going on in your body according to my studies. All right, now, so we're not mad at the doctor, but he puts that image on the inside of you if you listen to it. Mm-hmm. And to quote Norval Hayes. Y'all remember Norval said this sitting at, the, at the, our altar, one, or at our uh, podium one time. He made this statement. He said, if you, you can go to a doctor. He said, if you listen to a doctor long enough, you'll probably right. die. Yeah. And he's right about that. Because right. you got to, not that they're not that they're wrong or negative. It's just they're not necessarily putting faith in it unless you got yeah, a good faith right. doctor. And it's hard to find one of those. But there are some out there. And so, all right, watch this now. If if you get a diagnosis, have you ever noticed this? A diagnosis of let's just let's make up one here. And diagnosis of you got you fourth degree, fourth stage cancer, and and you know I give you two weeks to live. If you had a diagnosis like that, and then somebody else comes along and says, well, you know, First Peter two twenty four says, with his stripes you're healed. Have you ever noticed how big this diagnosis seems and how small that scripture sounds? And Jesus said it was that way. He said, the word of God is seed, Mark chapter 4. He said, and when the, it's like the whole kingdom of God is like a seed. And when it's first sown, when it's first gone into your heart, it's smaller than all the seeds that be in the earth. In other words, you got cancer, you're going to die is actually a bigger thing in your mind than by stripes are healed. And sometimes people say, you know, man, those scriptures, I know you want me to get them, but man, you just don't know what the doctor said because this is so weighing on their mind. Well, Jesus said, but the idea is, because he said this in March chapter 4, he said, but when it is sown, it's smaller at first, but when it's sown, it groweth up. So if you give the word time, the word gets bigger and the cancer gets smaller. But you have to give it time to overcome it. Amen. And the more, and how does it get bigger? The more you use your imagination. Come on. Seeing yourself the way yes. God declared you. Yes. Dodie Osteen, when she Come was on. diagnosed with metastatic cancer of the liver in, in, two, in 1981, sent home with two weeks to live. Mm-hmm. Clothes falling off of her because she had lost so much weight. And doctors said there's nothing they could do. John said, well, we're believing for a miracle. And, and long story short, she went home. She said what she did is she took photographs of herself, snapshots in those days, and plastered them over the pictures of her in her health doing what she enjoyed. Most of them were like horseback riding. She loved a horseback ride. Now she's physically unable to do anything. And so she put all the pictures she could over the mirrors in her house so that when she would go to look in the mirror, all she could see is the image of what she used to be. And so that image of what the mirror would show her, she wouldn't let that in her heart. And one of the things she said, she told her family now, and her family, she had her oldest son was a surgeon medical doctor. Paul was a surgeon at that time, doctor. And the point I'm trying to get you to make, she wouldn't let, she told her family, told him who's a medical doctor, told John, told all the other girls and the son-in-laws and the daughter-in-laws and all of them and, and said, listen, I do not want the word cancer mentioned one time in my house. Don't say cancer to me. Don't say, why? What was she doing? Is she in denial? Yeah, she's in denial. She's in denial. Not that the cancer exists, but it has, she's denying that it has the right to exist in her body. She's not, she's not saying, there is no cancer, there is no cancer. That wasn't what she's saying. That's mind over matter, and that doesn't work. That's metaphysical, and it doesn't work. What she's saying is, God says I'm healed. I do not take this report. I am healed. I don't give cancer the right to operate in my body. Well, the long story short of that, many people have had similar diagnoses and died, just like the medical science said. But here it is now, 38 years later, and she's in, she's in perfect health. What's she going to say? She, she still does that. She, she's done that now for these 38 years, does it every day. She goes over those same scriptures that brought her healing three times a day, 38 years. Someone said, why did you quit now? The cancer's gone. She said, because I don't want it to come back, so I'm going to keep it off of me. And she's holding on to that image. Somebody say man if you can see that. So because you've been created by God, we mentioned a little while ago, you're wired with God's DNA. Genesis 128, God created man in his own image. Now what is God? He's the creator of all, right? Yes. 
And if I'm created in the image of the Creator, then I've been made to create as well. How do I do it? The same way He did. I believe in my heart and I say with my mouth. God's the greatest of all creators that's ever been made. Now, He created us to be in His image. He stamped His divine image on us. Our job then is to take our imagination. Go Now, watch this. Our job, our assignment as believers is to take our, take our imagination, go into the future of what we believe we receive, and bring that future back into our present time. In other words, see yourself as you want to be and then start acting like the person you want to become. Same way in your... In your um, uh, it, it, not just in your healing, that's just one example, but even in your success in business. Amen. Imagination, our belief system, is the powerful way that we actually receive major goals and, and, uh, and accomplishments in our life. Yes. And this is the way it, successful people do it, is they've learned to take. That's why I told you about the businessman. He's one of the most successful businessmen in our world today. And he'll tell you, he said, ever since I started, he said, I'll still take two hours a day. And this is a man that deals with billions of dollars. Uh -huh. And he said, I'll still take two hours a day to sit in a private room where all I do is imagine that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I imagine myself doing big business deals right. and carrying Amen. on. David, David Thorpe, let me, let me tell you this and I'll let you go home. I, I'll be quick about it. Uh, Jim, Jim Thorpe, y'all remember the American Indian athlete that won the decathlon in 1912? He, he was, he was a, one of the Olympic uh, trainees in the 1912 Olympics and he was on the track team. He wanted to run the decathlon in the Pentagon. I usually say the other one, pentathlon or whatever it is. But he, the main one was the decathlon. And uh, it was kind of interesting because they had gotten on a cruise ship, the, the track team and, and many of the uh, Olympic people from the U.S. had gotten on a, a cruise ship to go over to Stockholm, Sweden, where the uh, events would take place. And the coach said he was walking around the deck one day saying how everybody's doing. Now, we're talking about a large cruise ship. And, and he came up and there was Jim Thorpe, the American Indian athlete, full dress clothes. He, he wasn't in his extra. He was leaned up against the lifeboat like this with both eyes closed. And the coach said, Jim Thorpe, what on earth are you doing? He said, Jim opened one eye and said, I am watching myself win the decathlon and closed his eye. Long story short, because we're out of time and he went on to win it. What he was doing, he was visualizing himself winning it before he got there. And he found out that, I, I told this I, to James this morning on the way. I wasn't planning on telling you, but it's just good to think about when you're talking about sports. There was a man that had a, a magazine a number of years ago. And he was actually riding one day in his home. He was a, he was a, a what do you call it, not a, not a pro bowler. He was a, an enthusiast. He liked to go bowling. His, his high score was a, an unimpressive 163. So, you know, he had never done anything great in bowling. But he was watching professional bowling while he was typing that day. And he said, I got to notice, and these guys hitting 280 and 300, some of them hitting 300, you know, and, and the way they would throw those strikes. And he said, I was watching this on TV. And he said, and this is back in the day now. This is back when, when the TV was, just looked real undimensional. He said, I kept watching those guys and he said, you know, I think I could do that. He said, I think I could go do just what I'm watching them do and start hitting strikes. Now, he had never bowled over 163, normally not that high. That was just the best he had ever had. And he said, he got so impressed on him. He said, I believe if I watch that long enough, I can do that. And he said, he went to, went, as soon as he had a chance, it wasn't that same day, but he said within a day or two, he went to the uh, bowling alley and he said, he got up there and he said, now I just went over those images in my mind of the way I saw them do that. And he said, for the first time in my life, I bowled 280. 283 or something. I forgot what it was, but 280 something. He said, bowl 280. Now, he said, the next game wasn't that good, and I quit, he said. But, but he said the idea was, and he began to teach athletes from that point, that if you'll begin to watch the people that you want to be like and do what they do and image that on the inside, you can get, thank you for your enthusiasm. See, you, you say, well, I'm, see, some of y'all, see, y'all, some of y'all are so silly. You look at me like, I ain't interested in that. I ain't going to go bowling. I ain't talking about bowling. I ain't talking about bowling. We don't want to see you out there bowling. <laughs> I'm talking about you being more successful than working for the man. You know, I'm talking about doing something in your life. Amen. and overcome. How many of you understand that? Say amen. I know you see that. But that was Jim Thorpe. You ought to read his story. It's amazing. Finally, last scripture I want you to look at is Ephesians, if you'll turn there real quickly. It, it, we, have, we actually are going to be faced with a test. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to close let you go home right here. But you're going to have to say, you know, I'm going to overcome this thing. Because you can use your faith. I'm joking with you about bowling. Because, you know, I'm just saying apply it to whatever. Right. Images right. are so important. Amen. Amen. That's right. For those of you that might be stuck in grief. I'm dealing with some people right now that are stuck in grief. That, you know, a, a loved one dies and, and they're just, they just can't get over it. And, and it's got to be hard. I'm not, I'm not naked. Especially if it's a child or something, you know, that wasn't supposed to happen. But I remember how God used imagination to change me. When my mother died uh, 10 years ago, last May, this past May, 10 years ago, I, I remember mother had been sickly and just, you know, we'd worked with her and she'd had the last year of her life, you know, had to have us, somebody over there all the time with her and, and just, you know, kind of 
helping her and Daddy and as they got older because they, they were sick. It, you know, both of them, Daddy was going through chemo and Mother was battling COPD and they were just had gotten sickly and weaker and weaker and weaker. And, and uh, that image of them like that, you know, and, and Mother died the day she died. I was, we were planting corn. And I, I know I told her at the breakfast table, I said, Mother, won't you? She's in a wheelchair. I said, Mother, won't you just come out there and plant corn with me? She said, no. She shook her head and then she said, yeah, let's go. <laughs> like that. She was ready to do it, you know. And a few minutes later, she had went to heaven planting corn with her mouth up there, I guess, speaking it out. <laughs> and, um, and then, I, of course, I had to, you know, you, you do the things you don't enjoy doing. You call the coroner and you call the, the morgue to come get her, whatever you call that, the uh, funeral home to come get her body and that kind of thing. And, you, you know, I mean, it's just not phone calls you enjoy making. And, and then I watched them carry mother through the house, you know, on the, on the gurney, at the, her last trip through her kitchen. And I was just, you know, that. And I couldn't get that image of her sick and, and her body laying there out of my mind. And then, you know, we were doing things. People, family were coming over. And, and, I, and I had ran. Daddy, who's still living at the time, asked me to go out and get an extension cord from the shop because he wanted to plug something up uh, for a fan or something. People were coming in. And so just as I stepped off the back porch, which was the route that they had carried mother out of the, of the house, her body, all of a sudden, it's just like a vision opened up in front of me and because I, I was battling this image that I was holding my mother, old and sickly. And I saw, Tanya, I saw my mother in front of me like this, just, you know, standing like, like as far as Ronnie is to me, about that far away from me. And she was like, I'm standing on the last step there of the deck and she's out there in front of me about like that. And she looked like what I remembered her when I was a little child, you know, maybe in her 30s, you know, just youthful prime and dark brown hair instead of the white hair and, you know, and all this. And, and she looked so pretty. And she said, now, y'all can do what you want to with this. But in that, in that image, she said to me, I'm, I'm not saying she appeared to me. I'm just saying there's a vision that the Lord let me see. And she said, James, don't see me that way the way I was carried. She said, I'm not like that. I'm in heaven doing much better now. Well, my image just changed. And see, if you can use your imagination to start seeing your loved one that you're grieving over, see them in heaven, see them in that land fairer than day and, and just enjoying time up there, waiting on you to get there. And when you get there, the joy y'all going to have around the, around the stools talking about what God has done, you know, and all the life of God. But you got to imagine that and that image will take you to that higher place if you can see that. Say amen. Ephesians, I'm closing now. Ephesians chapter 3. Is this helping anybody? Yes. All right, praise God. Those of you that's helping can stay. Those that are not, go wait in the car and we'll let you know when we're done. Ephesians chapter 4. Now, I gotta do, I'm going to do this quick because I know time's gone. Let me back up to 3 just to show you real quickly. He's talking about imagination. Verse 14, For this cause I bow my knees to the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. And here's what he's asking. This is 3.16. Ephesians 3.16. He said, I'm praying, in other words, that God, would grant you according to the rich supply of His glory that you would be strengthened with might by His Spirit inside your inner man. Amen. Now your inner man is your heart where we do the imaginations, where we do the believing, where we see it. That's right. You see that? And He said if you'll get Him, His ideas big in your heart, in your inner man, verse 17, then Christ would be able to dwell in your hearts by faith. Come on. That you had become rooted and grounded in love. You'd be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, length, depth, and height. You'd see all the dimensions of God, in other words. The more you imagine Him in your heart, the more you begin to experience His dimensions. Right. See, I, I've got to point this out to you. He's, now look at me, look at me, because I'm closing here quick. This, he's talking to people that are spirit-filled people that God lives inside right. of them. Yes. But he said, now He's saying to people, Scott, that God's already living inside of them. He's saying to them, if you'll do this that I'm telling you, God will, you'll experience God inside of you. So just because God's inside of you doesn't mean anything unless you're holding the image of it. He said, but once you begin to get strengthened by your inner man, then all of a sudden Jesus, who's already in you, starts living in you by faith. Now, right. you start and then you start experiencing all dimensions, the length, the breadth, the depth, the height of God. Mm -hmm. And you know, and watch this. Now, you don't, you don't realize, he, he's, you think, hey, he's not talking about imagination. You watch this. You'll be able, verse 18, able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, length, depth, and height of God. And you'll know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, so that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. They're already full of God, but he said you're going to experience that fullness. And then he adds this. Now unto him, where is he that's in you, that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or imagine. The word think there in most translations is the word imagine. Amen. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or imagine according to the power that's at work within us. Amen. Amen. And then skip down because of time. Go right quickly now to chapter 4. 
He says, don't make the mistake that other people do and let your heart become darkened. Verse 17, this I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you from this point on walk not as other Gentiles walk in the emptiness, vanity of their mind or their imagination. Watch it in your scriptures. Now. Watch it in your scripture. He said, you can actually get to a place that you, a believer, acts just as dead as the world does wow. by simply not holding the proper images oh, in your wow. heart. Oh, wow. You, you say, but I'm spirit-filled. I speak in tongues. Yeah, but you've got the, the image of just a loser inside of you. And God is not the loser in you. You don't, you don't see yourself. So again, look at 17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you from now on walk not as other Gentiles walk in the emptiness, vanity of their mind. Amen. Having the understanding, or we could say having the imagination darkened because they're alienated from the life of God through the ignorance. You, you, did you catch that? What makes you alienated? From the life of God, ignorance. Right. It's what you don't know or what That's you're not right. exercising right. in thoughts. Right. Having, been, uh, uh, un having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through ignorance that's in them because of the blindness of their heart or not seeing what God says. Right. Amen? Amen. Amen? So they, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all in cleanliness with greediness. In other words, 19 says, if you don't let God get in your imagination, then you're on your own in life. Oh, wow. But you have not so learned Christ this way. Verse 21, some of y'all not following with me in the scriptures, but watch it. If so be that you've heard him and have been taught of him, and the truth is in Jesus, read verse 22 for me. Pick up right there. You ready? That you put off concerning the former conversation of the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Now look at me, because I know you got all different translations, and we sound funny trying to read that. Look at me. Here's what he said. Don't make the mistake that the rest of the world's making. You're a believer. God lives inside of you. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you ask or imagine yeah. if you'll start imagining and the power will go to work in you when you start imagining. Yeah. But he said, you make the mistake and you'll be like the rest of the world who has empty lives because they're ignorant to what God wow. is. Wow. And he said, you're going the same way. But if you'll put, if you'll do this, get the right image of God yes. in you, you'll be able to put off the old man which is defeated yes. and you'll put on the new man which created, is created in righteousness and true yes. holiness. Verse 23, by doing it, here's how you do it. Verse 23. Be renewed in yes. the spirit of your mind Amen. by yes. simply getting your imaginations built back on God. Anybody get anything Amen. out of that today? Yes. So Amen. anyway, the new man is put on just that way. Amen. So the way you dress yourself is by seeing yourself clothed just the way that God yes. said. Amen. There's a formula for imagination. There's a formula. Listen to this. You don't have to write all these downs, but it's to get your goal, get your purpose. Start doing prayer because if you don't get God involved, your imagination is going to be dangerous to you. Amen. Plan, plan, plan. Have innovative thinking. Yes. Come up with new ideas. Let God give you new ideas to think Amen. about. That's right. Add enthusiasm to it. Come on. Amen. You, yes. You're never going to see anybody successful that doesn't have enthusiasm. That's right. Amen. And, and Amen. Because, here's why. Why would, a, why would you find a person not enthusiastic about something? Because they can't see it succeeding. Right. But if you see it succeeding, you're excited when they're just digging the foundation. Amen. You're excited. Amen. Right, so it's, so uh, here's, here's the formula. Get a goal or purpose. Get your prayer and put planning or innovative thinking. Get enthusiastic about it. Go to work on it. Yeah. And then go to work. That means you've got to actually do something for your dream. And then hold the image of that success on the inside of you. Yeah. And listen, I give you, I give you this last word. Life is full. Life Amen. is rich. And it always will be as long as you keep God right in the middle of it yeah. and keep your imaginations full of Him. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Did you get anything out of that today? Yeah. All right, stand to your feet.